Our first speaker of the 2020 symposium is, I am very pleased to say, Julia Midgley. Julia is, I suppose, our English contingent of the symposium. She has been making prints since her time as a student at the Mid Cheshire College. She is the recipient of national awards for drawing, painting and printmaking. In 2016, examples of her work were short shortlisted for the Derwent and the Ruskin Drawing Prizes. She's a regular uh, exhibitor at the Royal Academy Summer Exhibition and drawing is the bedrock of Julia's work. Sketchbooks provide subject matter which is developed into etchings. Julia is a member of the Royal Society of Painter Printmakers, one of the world's premier printmaking organisations. So please relax and enjoy Julia's presentation. Hello, I'm Julia Midgley. I'm an artist printmaker and I'm also a reportage artist, which means that um, drawing is the bedrock of what I do and it feeds and informs directly my printmaking. Um, so sketchbooks are always the starting point. Um, and there's always a sketchbook in my bag, pocket um, and toolkit. And they are a form of visual notebook. So when I'm working towards a new print, I'll have a germ of an idea, and then I will start um, making some doodles in a sketchbook or, or um, come up with ideas, or indeed looking for more material uh, to feed into that idea. So what I'm going to do is um, spotlight a selection of etchings from uh, the past couple of decades and try and explain my process uh, and that process and, that, and the subject matter are very closely in, intertwined. Um, everything that I draw and everything in my um, resulting artworks, all of those things have been directly observed by me and usually drawn in a sketchbook. So. Um, when I'm working towards a new print, uh, as you can see here, there's a few little sketches. This is working towards an etching um, that's called Mask. Uh, and the idea stemmed from my then four-year-old son who had a panda mask and he would uh, play around in the house uh, wearing this mask. And it became um, almost, <laughs> in, he became almost inseparable from it. But, at the same time that he was doing this, a friend of mine had been to the Venice Festival of Masks. And um, that set me thinking because I had, at the same time, been working on a, a few images using um, pagan history and um, characters from pagan history and folklore. And um, locally in a village here called Nutsford, every year they have a May Day profession which is led by a green man and so forth. So, all these ideas were rumbling around in my head and I thought I would try and um, uh, gather them all into one image. So here on the left hand side there is a selection of characters from my sketchbook and apologies for the poor quality of the photographs. Uh, some from the Venice Festival of Masks and some again as you can see with my son and on the right he was in a swing. Um, and that led me to think of, or reminded me of, Fragonard's very frilly lady in a swing, a famous painting that um, I remember having to deal with in um, art history lessons on my foundation course, and thinking it wasn't quite my cup of tea. So I gathered all these ideas together um, and thought, well, how am I going to put these into an image? And this was um, what became the final design for the print, and this is very typical of my working process. I'll do a same size um, drawing uh, as the ultimate plate will, become, will be. I'm also one of those people who has a great deal of difficulty with backgrounds because 
I'm only interested in the characters and what's happening in my images. I'm not really interested in what's behind them. So it's always a problem. Um, I thought in this instance that maybe if I looked down from a bird's eye view, it might provide an interesting um, composition. Uh, fortuitously, a friend of mine uh, wore, uh, had been talking to me about this idea, and she said, you need for the horses, particularly the flying horses seen from above, it might be an idea if you come with me to my friend's um, racehorse training swimming pool, which we did, and it basically it was like a huge trench cut into indoors um, in a vast building, but it, uh, the horses walked very happily down a ramp into the warm water and would swim around and you were able to stand on the ground looking down at them and this enabled me to make these drawings of horses. And why horses with relation to this print? Well, I've always been mad on horses. I grew up with ponies um, and that love's never left me and um, they are a recurring um, image in all of my work really. So here we are, this is becoming a rather irreverent swipe at Fragonard's frilliness. This is the, re the result of that. This is the finished print. Um, originally I was going to print it in black but um, felt a slightly softer colour might be better. And in order to make the um, <clears throat> foreground very distinct and the distance <clears throat> more indistinct. Um, I used a, a sort of black, blue, grey mixture of uh, colours uh, mixing the inks here in the studio. And then for the background or distance, uh, I used what was actually silver ink, but by the time, because I only wiped things up at the same time on the plate, um, it got a little bit of a tint of blue into it. Um, you can see that uh, originally the shadows cast by the flying horses have a sort of crayon effect. Um, that's because initially it was just plain flat aqua tint. But I felt that was a bit harsh, so I burnished away at that aqua tint um, just to soften it. So it's, it's rather crudely done really, but um, Anyway, there's the finished print, and I, I was happy with this. I felt, you know, um, I'd stretched myself a bit, and I enjoyed doing it, and I um, felt, yes, okay, that, that's worked. So I'll enter it for a few competitions and um, exhibitions, um, and <laughs> it got nowhere at all. Nobody hung it up or accepted it for anything. So I thought, well, I'll put it in the plan chest and leave it there for um, a while, and in fact, I left it there for quite a long while, and ten years later, nine or ten years later, took it out of the plan chest and submitted it for um, a few things, and it was hung in the Royal Academy Summer Exhibition. Um, it won uh, an award in uh, the Royal Society of Printmakers uh, annual open exhibition at Bankside Gallery, and that prize was to have um, an article written about it in Printmaking Today magazine. So, I don't know what you learn from that, but um, if at first you don't succeed, keep resubmitting to things. This is a copy of the article that was written, and um, I'm quite pleased about this because they showed the working drawing for it and the finished print. Um, I suppose I should say at this point, my, my prints are really very much a vehicle for my drawing. They are not complicated, technically, uh, difficult to produce. They are very traditionally made using a line etching first and then I put the aqua tint on. Often things happen as always happens when you're printmaking but um, I, I use a burnisher or I can um, scrape out some errors and um, that suits me and I work on zinc rather than copper and that's because in the early days when I first had my own press, it was in the cellar of our house, and we had young children, and the uh, fumes for etching on copper uh, are deemed to be much more noxious than um, those of nitric acid, which is required, of course, for 
etching on zinc. So the next print called County Conundrum was a commission and this does happen occasionally, not terribly often, but a commission will come in for, a, for an original print and that's wonderful really because um, it gives you a different string to your bow, I suppose, and, and a sense of confidence that your printmaking is appreciated by other people. Uh, and this was commissioned by the Arts Office of Cheshire at the time, who was called Doreen Halewood, and um, she said that um, the following year, which was only about six months hence at that point, was going to be the centenary of Cheshire County Council, and they would like to commission something to commemorate that, an artwork. Um, so uh, that's quite a big subject if you think about it, the history of a county and I thought well the best thing for me to do is to um, focus on artworks and artefacts and um, special points of interest ghost stories, folk stories in the county that I knew about and that also I would then have to do quite a lot of research for oh sorry I didn't say um, that's an Elizabeth Frink flying man, a sculpture by Elizabeth Frink, at Manchester Airport. Originally, it was sited inside the main, um, I suppose, the main area after you've been through, uh, actually, I think it's before you go through check-in, the main uh, reception area, as it, were, as it was then. But now, um, it's outside. This photograph was taken anyway quite a long time ago because there's my young son again and he's now in his 30s but <laughs> um, he's trying to uh, copy what the sculpture's doing other things I went to look at during the course of making this etching were um, Rolls-Royce Rolls-Royce are made in Cheshire and um, or some a large part of the manufacturing process is made here and the Spirit of Ecstasy, I thought, would be a really excellent piece of artwork to have in the print, designed by oh, crikey, Charles Sykes. I was just going to say, I've forgotten his name. <laughs> um, here are some other items that I wanted to include and did include. Anderton Lift, top left. Um, Elephant Castle, this wonderful sculpture in a village called Peckforton. And um, in a cottage garden, I think it must have been um, connected to Peckerton Castle. Maybe they wanted to commemorate or have some big sculpture there. But it was said to me that um, it's not really Elephant and Castle. Well, clearly, that is what it looks like. It, the name Elephant and Castle comes from Infante de Castilla, who she was... Um, to be married to Edward II and was brought over from Spain, Infanta de Castile. Uh, there is another carving of this same elephant castle motif in uh, at the end of one of the pews in Chester Cathedral, which is also in the final print. On the right, you can see, uh, and appropriate enough for the current times, a plague stone. This is in um, Upton, outside Chester, it's a solid rock into which is carved a vessel uh, in, and that would be filled with vinegar. And those people suffering from the plague would put coins, their coins, into the vinegar so that it was, um, all that any germs were neutralised. And that on top of the stone, uh, healthy members of the community would leave um, food and take the money. Bottom left is a sculpture by... Um, a, an artist sculptor called Ted Rucroft, who taught at Manchester School of Art when I was a student there, uh, although I wasn't doing sculpture. But I grew up in the same village that he lived in and would always enjoy passing his house because there would be wonderful totems and sculptures and uh, wooden characters, sometimes quite disturbing, outside his house. Um, so I really wanted to include his work in the print. And this is the finished print. Uh, it contains 40 items altogether, all of them seen and drawn uh, in the uh, counting in my sketchbooks. Uh, Ted Rucroft's pig has changed colour and it has candles on its back, bottom right-hand corner, because uh, there's a folklore in Mid-Cheshire about um, 
people being haunted by a giant pig with candles on its back jumping in front of people's cars, even today, on a narrow country lane. Um, Doddle Bank is there, Anderson Lift. There's Elizabeth Frink's Man in the Sky. And again, you'll recognise this as a motif that happens quite often in my work, is um, flying figures in the sky. Um, it was decided that um, the County Council uh, didn't really want or couldn't afford to pay for a whole edition to be made, so we agreed that I would produce 30 copies. Uh, they would have 15 and I would have 15, which worked very well. And in order for a competition to work, everyone would need to know the answers to what every object was in the image. So uh, I made a key, an identifying key, and, and this again has become something of a habit and a really useful thing to do if your um, prints or images are complicated and have a lot of content. So moving on from there, I um, decided to do some more personal work or self-initiated work, and um, the horse theme continues here. I was interested in um, some old photographs of myself, which you can see the little black and white photographs uh, in the middle of this image. And that's me as a child in fancy dress on my pony, <laughs> Chutney. She, and I also appear at the top of the central column of that um, drawing on the right-hand side. Other photographs there are, are from fairgrounds. Um, there's beautiful bronze horses in St Mark's in Venice. Uh, and the uh, monkey, top left, is one from a set of three in the Louvre. And that, that's there because it had been in a previous print and had been centre of focus in that print. And again, this is another one of my habits. I will tend to bring a favoured object or character from one series of work through into the next, sort of lending a, uh, a link and, and con continuation of thought through um, my output, if you like. I think probably it's only just to satisfy me, really, rather than um, expecting people to understand it. Other items I thought I wanted to include were these um, weighed porcelain horses which were very popular in my childhood. Um, and we used to save our pocket money and buy them. You could get them in two sizes, you can see here. And um, I think there must have been about eight or nine different models of these. And I was captivated by them. They were beautifully sculpted, actually. Those little ones are hardly bigger than an inch high. So this is the line stage. Uh, and again, I, I, what am I going to do about background? I decided, how was I going to show all these different horses and sculptures of horses and equestrian um, imagery? How was I going to show all that um, without them all being on the same level? So I decided to use plinths and columns. And again, these plinths and columns have been in some previous work I'd been involved with. Uh, and it worked quite well as a device. But I still thought, well, I don't want to put them in a landscape. So... A chessboard is what it became, a checkered floor. And um, that seemed to work quite well, especially with the sort of a rectangular base of the plinths. So having got this far, and it takes a long time on a plate this size, which was 43 by 49 centimetres, the plate. So I would um, get out my watercolours and inks and try and give myself an indication of where I'd like to put any colour, if I'm going to use colour, uh, and any aquatint. So I just play around with uh, my watercolour box on top of a proof. And this is the finished piece, so really um, quite close to what I had hoped to achieve. Um, as you can see, I'm not really a great colourist. I um, have a very limited palette when I'm working with etchings. Um, I suppose if I wanted to have a lot of bright colour, I would have been a silkscreen printmaker. But I, again, I think the best people to do silkscreen are probably painters rather than drawers. Uh, but that's just me thinking. That's just a personal view. So then um, there was another commission for Liverpool Cathedral, uh, another centenary. So um, 
they do seem to be good centenaries for artists because people like to commission work. Um, you can see in the background here um, my preparatory work. You can see uh, a Liverpool book on the desk, some sketches on the desk, and a larger, almost, well, it, that was the finished design, the red piece of work that's propped up on my desk. Sketchbooks, photographs, and notes, and in the distance, more photographs and reference and texts uh, to help me try and make some sense out of, again, what was a very complicated um, brief. This is the final design, and I think with hindsight, I would uh, and should have said to them, this brief is too complicated. The cathedral rather wanted to include the themes of hope, spirit, light, um, the history of the building itself, and the people who had worked on it and in it since it was being built to the current day, and um, also elements of the building and uh, stories. So really, there was too much to try and cram into one image. Um, and also, I had a very short deadline for this. I think I was only commissioned in November, and um, the deadline was the beginning of April, the following year, when the Queen, which, is, which would be the centenary year, and the Queen was going to present the Maundy Thursday money at Liverpool Cathedral that year. It was very unusual. Anyway, so this was the design. You can see um, elements along the bottom of um, tile patterns in the floor. Um, some of the words and scripts I'd noticed either in the walls or on the organ and some of the keys from the organ. Um, and then a whole bevy of people, some of whom are real individuals and some of whom are illustrated in the stained glass windows or uh, are uh, figures from the original commissioning of the building. Uh, so this was the plate. Um, now, I don't trace my drawings. I, I like to keep the original design alongside me, and I just work directly from that. I find if I'm tracing, I somehow lose the spontaneity of mark. I don't know, it makes the lines a little bit thicker. Um, nor do I smoke the surface of the plate, which a lot of artists do. Um, I've just never done it, so you know, I just carry on doing it the way I do it. Um, I made a couple of mistakes, you can see in the text, near the bottom, just underneath the Bible. I would um, had to stop out a couple of mistakes, where <laughs> painstakingly trying to get the right font for some of the lettering. I'd not reversed it or not used a mirror image, so... Anyway, I don't think anyone noticed in the end. The rather larger figure in the background, uh, top left of this plate, is of um, an Elizabeth Frink sculpture, uh, which is in the, well, there's a very large version on the front, above the front door of the cathedral, and a maquette inside the cathedral. So Elizabeth Frink seems to feature, she pops up in my work. This is a, a photograph of the plate itself, and you can get some idea of how complex it is. Um, it took at least an hour to wipe it and um, prepare it ready for each print. Um, I can't, just trying to think how many we did in the edition, but um, it was quite, uh, <laughs> you set yourself a hard task. One of the other things I did, uh, this is the final image. And uh, the various other things that are important about this in that the paper is Somerset cream paper. And the color of the ink is a sort of reddy brown color. Again, I kind of mixed it with my inks here. And both those things are important. The um, vestments worn by the clergy at Liverpool Cathedral are not white, they're cream, and always have been. And this is something very particular to Liverpool. So the paper reflects that, the color of the paper. You can't see on this slide so well, actually, but it's a sort of cream-colored paper. And the color of the ink um, was mixed specifically to reflect the colour of the sandstone used to build the cathedral itself. 
Um, so again, that's quite a large plate. I think that's probably the largest I've done, 45 by 49 centimetres. Um, there's a key again here, and you can see from this that it is quite complex. Um, and there were 64 different items to um, identify in the image. And I think that's the largest plate or most complicated plate I've ever done, really. So um, Liverpool crops up quite a lot in my uh, work because I taught at the art school for um, quite a long time there, part-time, part but over quite a lot of years. Um, but some of the side effects of teaching are that, um, particularly if you're teaching documentary drawing, which is what I was there to do, was um, that you get to take your students out drawing regularly and uh, observing certain aspects of Liverpool life in this case. Um, and on the dock, on the Albert Dock in Liverpool, there was always a lot of activity. There were, at that time, the Maritime Museum had a lot of um, huge propellers and uh, marine boys on display there. And um, there was also another museum called the Museum of Liverpool Life, which is no longer there. And inside, they had a Grand National display, which, of course, um, was a great favourite of mine, personally. And in that display, they had the skeleton of a racehorse called Ambush, who won the Grand National uh, in the very early 20th century, 1902, something like that, or 1901. And that was the only winner of the National to have been owned by a member of the royal family. Uh, so I was sketching, the, you can see the top image here. Um, I'm trying to take the horse out of the museum and set it free on the Albert Dock amongst the people there. And amongst the people who we were drawing that day was a group of actors rehearsing for some play and welders repairing some of the marine boys. Uh, this is the final image and, um, oh, I think I must have, yes, on this, sorry, on the lower image here, you see uh, that was a line state that's just only got the line work on it, but then it did need, I didn't want to have a lot of clutter in it, especially after having done the cathedral etching. I just felt it needed some shadows. So this is the finished print with the shadows added and still a clear, uncluttered background. And um, I think if you don't have a background or you don't have any shadows, then the <coughs> objects in the image would be here to be floating rather randomly. So I think the shadows secure it to the ground. And here's a couple of details. So then again, through working at the art school, um, we'd had a, a, a staff and student exhibition in the town, and uh, one of the people who'd seen that um, had, put, had mentioned me to um, an arts centre in Provence, owned by um, a Scandinavian millionaire whose parents were, or had been, um, well, notable European printmakers. Uh, they were actually uh, specialists in woodblock, really. And um, so he, well, he owned this vineyard in Provence, very close to Cézanne's mountain, Mont saint victoire Well, obviously, it's not his mountain, but the one he painted a lot. And he had the idea that it would be nice when he wasn't using the house at the vineyard for his own personal and family use. Um, it would be nice in the sort of cold months of the year from January to March to offer it to uh, a mixed group of European artists to make work there and to refer to Cézanne. Uh, so um, very fortunately, I was one of those artists and these were some of the first drawings I made. Um, and in these you can see, yes, there's horses, but we did see, or I did see, horses in Provence in fields. Uh, the trees are very typical of that region. Uh, but there's a leopard there, a spotted leopard, and that is actually based on uh, a sculpture that I once made drawings of and subsequently used quite a lot in early work. And the sculpture is one of a pair of leopards um, owned by the Royal Collection, and um, I'd seen it in the Museum of... Oh, what was it called? The World Museum. Was it called the World Museum? Oh, it'll come back to me. But anyway, in London, it was... Um, just behind the Royal Academy, but is no longer there. 
So here is the leopard and here is the horse. And behind it is the slab-like um, side of Mont Saint-Victoire. The mountain's a bit like a wedge shape smooth and long and sloping on one side and then there's a sort of vertical drop where all these slab shapes come down on what I would call the um, cliff edge side. So that was again the first stage of that print. Um, this was the second stage, just filled in with aquatint, no clever stuff other than that, it's just a line stage, putting the etching of the line in and then following it up with aquatint. So during that time we visited Cezanne studio in um, Aix-en-Provence where you could go in and absorb that studio and his presence. Nothing had been changed in that room since his death and it's meticulously kept like that. So it is quite dusty, but um, all his materials are there and his shelves of belongings, jars, bottles, teapots, all the things that you would recognize from his still lives were all there. And these are the little sketches I made at the time. And I thought it'd be quite nice to somehow make a, a print about this that um, included my experience of the mountain, which we'd been climbing up which is not a terribly difficult climb, but uh, the artists had all been taken up there by guides, or myself and the students. And um, I'd like to combine that with what I saw in Cezanne's studio. So this was the first um, stage of the plate. Um, it's a large-ish plate, it's 34 by th uh, 49. Um, this is the slopey side of the mountain. There's the leopard passing through in the sky. I did mention, I think, that you know, this becomes a bit of a device with me, this passing through in the sky. Um, leaning against the railings, those railings actually are there. You can see Cezanne's Cupid figure and a selection of his jars and pots on the ground. Clearly at this stage, it definitely is in need of some shadows from the leopard passing by and some aquatint. So again, I put some wash and watercolour and ink on to try and design exactly how I wanted it to look. And this was the finished print. Uh, you can see there's quite a lot of sort of bobbly marks in the um, aquatin. I apply aquatin through a little muslin bag that I just shake over the um, plate. I don't have a, an aquatin box as such. Um, and it, it works quite well, really. But I did have to, uh, in order to get that shadow to be visible, you see there on the rough, I, it was actually more noticeable. But I, I did have to try and um, burnish away some of the aquatint around the shadow. And I did that using um, a square block of charcoal. Someone told me a few years previously that it's very effective at, as it were, half rubbing out aquatint. And who would have thought that? So then, um, in the year 2000, um, the Arts Council decided to celebrate the new millennium with something called Year of the Artist, and their aim was to place artists in organisations where you wouldn't expect to find them and introduce new audiences to um, how artwork is produced. And very fortunately for me, I was approached by Blackpool Pleasure Beach because their head of PR had coincidentally seen an exhibition of my reportage work. And so in, thing, in terms of things being bizarre, and, and I do like to include the bizarre, the unexpected, and, and um, anything that's out of the ordinary in my work, and this certainly was that. This photograph um, was taken on the press day of the launch of a new ride at the Pleasure Beach called Valhalla. So all those people uh, uh, who are wearing their helmets, their Viking helmets, are actually journalists. And a lot of them from very serious newspapers, the Times, the Observer, the Telegraph, are all there. Largely because of the um, very generous hospitality offered to journalists when the Pleasure Beach was launching a new ride. So there I am standing amongst them all on a log or something so I can see above the horns. 
So, um, yes, all the attending journalists had to wear costumes. Uh, that's how you can tell who's on the staff and who isn't. Um, so, it was just such a bizarre experience. But here in the, are a couple of little details from the plate. I, there was a, a, what do you call it, a, a roundabout which had aircraft, looked a bit like rockets that would swing round in a circle. And I did notice during one of the speeches that some of the journalists had escaped onto this uh, roundabout. And you could tell they were journalists because they were wearing their horned helmets. And on the right is um, a large wooden sculpture of a Viking. It was also part of the day's celebrations. And this is the finished image. Um, I think, again, I printed it on Somerset Cream, but I was beginning to get a bit of the view um, that I should start printing on white. Because if you print on Somerset Cream and if you mount it in a, a champagne-coloured mount so that it seamlessly blends the colour of the paper into the mount. It looks very good when you just have it here in the studio, but when it's hung in an exhibition surrounded by other artworks with, say, uh, under glass with white mounts and white backgrounds, that cream takes it back and it kind of deadens it. So I've now decided to um, print more often on an off-white or white paper. Uh, this was another print from the Pleasure Beach, and I just loved seeing grown-ups and um, the unexpected, again, riding on merry-go-rounds. Uh, the figure on stilts at the back is actually a sculpture, but they did used to have people wandering around on, on stilts, and they had a theatre, so the spotlight theatre lights are there to reflect that. And actually, at the end of this project, I'd produced um, I think 212 artworks. There were some very large paintings. There were a lot of much smaller ones, about A3 size. And I think about six different etching plates were produced. Um, this one and Flights of Fantasy were both eventually hung in the summer exhibition, which was good news for me. I always feel pleased when that happens. Um, but in this case, the couple who were riding these horses, uh, I think they were Indian, and they weren't... I saw them getting onto the roundabout, and they were quite elderly and not particularly fit-looking, and they moved quite slowly, as if, you know, they might be arthritic or something like that. But once they were on those merry-go-round merry horses, carousel horses, they were just having a ball. And that's the wonderful thing about the Pleasure Beach. It's there to enable people to have fun. So moving on, um, there was a brief, not so much a commission, but um, I'm a member of the Royal Society of Printmakers. And that has um, its uh, gallery, its home, is on, it's called Bankside Gallery, on the South Bank, next door to Tate Modern, and very close to the Globe Theatre. And uh, Another centenary was coming up of um, Shakespeare's, oh, I can't remember his birth or his death, but um, they approached the society and said, uh, would artists like to submit work for an exhibition at the Globe Theatre during the centenary year? And um, so, of course, we all said, oh, yes, we'd love to do that. And um, so here were my first steps in responding to the brief and here's something, my cast list. Well, it was a theatre. Um, the postcard on the left I'd picked up at the Royal College of Surgeons, where I'd been working on another project to do with medicine. And um, it's such a bizarre image. It's actually a photograph um, from... Ooh, let me just think, where was it from? just can't remember, come back to me in a minute, but it's a photograph, a German photograph of a German actor called Desiree. And um, he dressed up as a fly to tempt Eurydice. Oh, he dressed up as Jupiter. And the story was that Jupiter changed into a fly in order to tempt Eurydice. Um, so this actor was dressed up as Jupiter, dressed up as a fly. And it is just such a bizarre image. 
And then on the right, they're at a folk festival, no, a jazz festival in North Wales. I saw these two girls in their fancy dress, ready for the parade. And the girl on the right, she, she looked amazing and, and quite spooky. So I thought, okay, so these two, these two people are going to be my puck. And there was the finished etching for puck with nothing at all behind him, no background whatsoever. Very simple, very simple etching. And um, I just let him occupy the whole picture frame, as it were. And Titania. So they made a pair. And sticking out of the side of Titania's huge hat, you see a funny little character. And, and that was actually um, something I'd seen. It was a hair comb. Uh, that a life model was using to keep her abundant hair in position while she was posing. And this was, this was weirdly in Sardinia, where I saw it, and I asked if I could photograph her comb. So you see also that Titania has three arms in here. That's just because the girl was moving and I drew her, and I wanted her to look like a mixture of a fly because of um, Jupiter having turned into a fly. Uh, so, yes, I've always got a very <laughs> strange mind. So that was Puck and Titania. And then um, my husband and I went to see um, a friend of mine who lives in Spetses, and en route we called in for a couple of days in Athens. Neither of us had been to Greece or the Greek islands before. And we saw these soldiers parading in front of one of the public monuments uh, with a very elaborate march that they did, and their shoes had pom-poms on them. And the drawing on the right is a sculpture of um, Alexander the Great on his horse. That was in the, um, the National Museum. Now, these figures um, were also in my studio at the time, and they are beginning to recur quite a lot in my imagery. They are child slaves who grew up on the plantations. And the figure on the right will reappear. No, I'm sorry, the figure on the left will reappear as an adult in the next slide on the right-hand side. And she became a major figure in the next um, large print I'm going to show you. But on the left, you can see what the inscription says in the preceding um, image of her as a child and this is the true picture of Mary Sabina who was born October the 12th, 1736 um, a plantation belonging to the Jesuits in the city of Cartagena in America of two Negro slaves um, so I had all these people and individuals and characters in mind and again decided, well, it's a sort of parade I, I think I'm going to do, and I'm going to put Mary uh, leading the parade somewhere to freedom, I suppose, leading everything away from anything they didn't want to be involved with. Um, and it's full of different individuals and characters, and this was one of the first working drawings I did, trying to position people and come up with a composition. This is the more detailed final drawing and plan for it. So, you know, my working process is always the same. It's, um, do the drawings, do the research, come up with a plan, and then draw the plate from there. So in amongst here, you can see Alexander the Great in the foreground. Bottom right-hand corner is Marina Marini's sculpture, which is in front of <coughs> the Guggenheim Museum, Peggy Guggenheim Museum in Venice. The soldiers are there with their high kicking. And actually, you will see um, Titania is there and Puck, uh, along with some other mounted um, huntsmen and women who are actually little lead figures that were left to me by my mother when she died in 2015. Uh, here's a few details from that print. And here's the finished print. And again, a white background, uh, no landscapes, no uh, townscapes, just white in the background. Uh, the large skull, the horse's skull, was being stored um, 
It was a mummer's horse from folk parades used locally in the museum in Northwich, and it was in the broom cupboard, um, painted black with red ribbons hanging down. And so those ribbons are there, but on the end of them are hanging cowrie shells, which again was something my mother uh, had given to me from her childhood for counting beads and things like that. So you can probably see Puck there. And, many, and there is Mary as a child in the middle of the print. And there are lots of other characters I haven't talked to you about, uh, but there isn't time, really. So um, in 2019, by the end of 2019, I thought it would be time to make a new print and to look back at the year. And um, locally, a friend had got very uh, involved with a pressure group for Remain, because, of course, 2019, there was nothing really much to discuss other than Brexit. Uh, and also the elections for MPs for the European Parliament, which uh, British MPs were still um, campaigning for. So on the left, I, a couple of images, I took my sketchbook to uh, the Hustings in Liverpool. And on the right, uh, a local meeting in a pub for our local Remain group. And the woman in the background with her hand up is called Virginia. And she was such an enthusiast and would always put her hand up for speaking. Um, and she has now become another of my motifs and pops up pretty often. And this was the rough of the drawing. Uh, Puck is in the sky. Virginia's in the foreground, flanked by the two women from the Hustings. But in the background, there's a whole selection of other figures who um, I'd observed in my sketchbooks on the big march, uh, the pro-Remain march in London on March 23rd, 2019. Uh, the toilet system was being carried along in that march. That's why it's there. And to the right of that system, there's a little drawing of me in uh, wearing a safety helmet because I was about to go and make some drawings um, in London of a new gallery being built for the Royal Watercolour Society. Uh, that was a sort of, that's been a long-term project I've been doing on and off at that point for about a year. So, again, a whole mixture of characters. Uh, and in the bottom right-hand corner, a, a child on that march with her placards, and placards are all over there. And here are a few details. Um, there's Virginia, looking a lot more, um, I suppose, like an expressionist figure. She's uh, looking quite angry there, which wasn't really in her nature, I don't think. Um, the, the face with the tricornered hat is from a mask in um, the National Museum in Dundee, and, or Dundee Museum and Art Gallery, I beg your pardon. And um, the man standing on a log is using a bit of a device, rather like a picture frame, so he's uh, clearly separate to um, the rest of the composition. And I'd just seen him uh, playing around with his child on stumps of wood, sticking up through the sand on Barmouth Beach. <laughs> As you do. And here's the image as a whole. This plate is um, rather smaller than the majority of my prints. It's 20 by 25 inches. And it's printed in a blue. Again, you know, a restricted palette. That's me. And so the final section of my talk is about um, a print that's literally um, only just been finished. Um, Nigel Morris from College Cambria had um, asked some artists to do workshops and then obviously. We couldn't do that because of the lockdown. So uh, whilst we were all still in one of the tier systems, uh, he came to the studio and spent a day recording um, me turning a drawing into a plate. And I'd been, uh, during lockdown, drawing, during lockdown, I'd been drawing on a Sunday afternoon online dance sessions. And um, this was a drawing from one of those sessions. On the left here, you see a couple more of those drawings. Um, and it's only an hour-long session, and, and the dancers move most of the time, but do hold their poses for about two minutes every now and then. The sea lion on the right is from Nosley Safari Park, and that's his um, keeper. I've been working on a project with the Safari Park, uh, a reportage project. And I just 
loved the enthusiastic relationship and symbiosis between keeper and sea lion. They would hug each other and kiss each other. <laughs> it's just wonderful to behold. So I wanted to try and do something with him, Arthur, but also I wanted to include the dancers and I wanted to include Virginia. Uh, so this was the first stab at the design, but I, I wasn't quite convinced by that. I was convinced about the three central figures, but poor Arthur, there wasn't any room for him. So this, was, this design was altered a bit on the plate and this is the first stage of the plate. And now we can see Arthur with his ball, which he balanced so expertly on his nose. The dancers themselves, the swathe of cloth and uh, Virginia in the background, still waving. But it needed aquatint on it and it needed something more adventurous in the background to hold the figures together. And so here's, um, again, on my worksheets, trying to decide where I'm going to put the aquatint. Uh, and you can see at this stage, I had actually put some aquatint on that sort of river-like um, uh, quality and texture behind the figures. But um, it obviously needed more, and I wanted to add bits here and there and um, give it some more impact. And I was aiming to have a clear white background in the sky as it were and on the ground. But I had an, a, a disaster um, because I got some foul bite. Actually, it was quite interesting foul bite. I rather liked the texture in a way, but I didn't like it in this particular image. So then that gave me a big problem. So what am I going to do about this? And um, in the end, I thought, well, I'll just try, uh, get my paintbrushes out again and have a go and see what it looks like with black sky. That's really what I did. So it went back in the aquatint. Uh, in fact, it went in a couple more times, altogether four times, I think. And here is an example of some of those stages that I went through. And um, I, we didn't do all of this in one day. We did up to the first stage, I think, um, with the first aquatint. But um, it was only afterwards that I managed to mess up the background. But funnily enough, now, I'm quite pleased with the fact that it has got a, a totally different background to my original intention. And this is something that so often happens with printmaking. It throws up unexpected results and you just have to be ready to deal with that and take it on board uh, and accept the exper semi-experimental accidental uh, effect that the medium can inflict on you. So here's a little detail of Virginia in the etching. And you can see how I deliberately left um, the aquatint to sort of space off from the figure so that it wasn't close up to the lines. I wanted, thinking I'm going to have a dark background in the sky, I needed them to have a sort of white halo effect around them, I thought. And this is the finished result. And to be honest, I, I think now it is better like this than it would have been if I'd had a white sky. I think it would have looked a bit empty. So, you know, um, mistakes aren't always such a bad thing. Um, in order to clear the foul bite from the bottom area, the ground, uh, you know, where there isn't any water evident, um, I burnished off quite a lot of it, but then that is quite hard work. So now before each print, I put French chalk over it and that seems to um, have the desired effect. So I've talked for quite long enough. Um, thank you very much for listening. Um, my website's there and um, that's my Instagram feed. And there you can see Puck once more, still featuring in the studio. Uh, and you can see the framed version of him on the floor beyond and the print coming off. So thank you very much and goodbye. <laughs>